Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's program is part of our Disability Education Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Council on Disabilities Awareness. Before we get started, I just want to go a few items with you all. Please note that ASL interpretation and live captioning are provided for today's session. This session is being recorded for educational purposes. It will be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has me this can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-hosts, and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I would like to introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Joining us today, we have Dr. Molly Colvin. Dr. Colvin is the Director of the Learning and Emotional Assessment Program at Mass General, as well as an Assistant Professor of Psychology at Harvard Medical School. She specializes in neuropsychological assessment of neural developmental disorders, emphasizing a whole child approach that promotes healthy social, emotional, and cognitive development by improving caregiver understanding and access to resources. In recognition of Mental Health Awareness Month, she joins us today to give a talk on mental health care for kids growing up with learning and neurodevelopmental disorders. Before I turn it over to her, Zari Amir Hassini, our Disability Program Manager at Mass General, has a few words to share. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you, Dr. Colvin, for agreeing to do this wonderful presentation for us today. So in um, celebration of Mental Health Awareness Month, I just wanted to share a couple of things for us to just keep in mind for not just the month, but throughout the year, since we are in a healthcare organization, which is also an educational institution, and we need to make sure that we're always aware of the community that we work with. So mental health in healthcare is a critical aspect that should not be overlooked. And here's are some key points to consider. Integrated care. It's essential to integrate mental care services to primary health care to ensure a holistic approach to patient care. Stigma reduction. Healthcare providers should work towards reducing stigma associated with mental health and to encourage individuals to seek help without fear of judgment. Training and education. Healthcare professionals should receive adequate training and education on mental health to identify, assess, and manage mental health concerns effectively. Collaborative care, a multidisciplinary approach involving healthcare providers, mental health professionals, and community resources is vital in comprehensive mental health care delivery. Patient-centered care. Healthcare providers should prioritize patient care, patient-centered care, taking into account the individual's mental health needs and preferences in treatment planning. And finally, supportive services. To assess supportive services such as counseling, therapy, and peer support groups should be readily available within healthcare settings to promote mental health well-being. So with that said, I um, pass it on to Dr. Colvin, and I'm very excited to hear her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and for those words to set the stage. I think they're perfect for what we're going to discuss this afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides um, so that we can all see them. 
And so I'm going to be speaking about mental health care for kids who are growing up with learning and neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and I have no disclosures related to this talk. As was mentioned, I'm director of the MGH LEAP program. We see over a thousand youth every year who present with a variety of neurodevelopmental, neurological, and psychiatric conditions. Um, and as we have been doing this work, especially over the course of the last few years, the relevance of integrating mental health care and understanding how mental health influences the presentation and treatment of these conditions has been more important than ever. And I'm hoping today um, to also impress upon you that the landscape has changed significantly since the COVID-19 pandemic. But I want to start by just talking a little bit about what neurodevelopmental disorders are. Um, because this is really a group of conditions that persist across the lifespan, and they begin in infancy or early childhood, but they may not be diagnosed until adolescence or even early adulthood. And they are heterogeneous, so some impact cognition, some impact social communication, some impact motor skills or behavior, and some impact all of these things. We consider them as being resulting from atypical brain development um, that may not necessarily be detected on diagnostic tests like blood work or MRIs or even EEGs. And many have no unknown etiologies, but some medical conditions are more likely to be associated with neurodevelopmental disorders than others. So some genetic disorders have neurodevelopmental disorders as part of their presentation. Um, if you see a child who has had perinatal brain injury, that may also be associated with a neurodevelopmental condition. And these things are also frequently comorbid, meaning that you can have more than one neurodevelopmental condition at a time. So I'm going to talk about some of the most common ones today, and I'm going to start by just doing a brief overview of a few of these that are most common, um, because I want to promote both um, knowledge about them, but also to highlight that there can be psychiatric comorbidity. Um, but this isn't going to be a talk that will go into a lot of detail about each of these conditions separately. But some of the more common neurodevelopmental disorders that you'll hear about um, or that you may know children who have include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, language disorders, learning disorders, autism spectrum disorder, and intellectual disability. So I'm going to start with ADHD. And the thing that I like to say when I'm speaking with parents about ADHD is that I actually would love to change the, the term. I don't love that the word deficit is in the title for ADHD um, because I think that I have never met a child who can't pay attention. They can all pay attention, but what kids with ADHD struggle with is regulating their attention. They struggle with paying attention to what they're supposed to pay attention to for as long and when they're supposed to pay attention to it. So often kids with ADHD have a bit of a superpower where they can focus and sustain attention and effort on preferred activities for a really long time. But for something that is harder or boring or too challenging, it can be really tough for them to focus and stay engaged. Children with ADHD may also present with hyperactivity and impulsivity, as well as weaknesses and a set of cognitive skills called executive functions that help us to access and use what we know. So these are skills like planning and organization or being able to change gears and move from one thing to the next. Um, and ADHD is very common. The current estimated prevalence rate is about five to 10% of the population. Um, is more commonly diagnosed in boys, and we also recognize that it is heritable. Um, so I'm going to talk now about language disorders, which can co-occur with ADHD. Language disorders are also a very heterogeneous um, category where there can be an impact on either or both expression, your ability to explain yourself and your ideas, or comprehension, which is also known as receptive language. There are genetic and environmental risk factors, and there are neuropsychological sequelae, or things that I can pick up on testing in about 40 to 50% of cases. For kids who have language disorders, they are at much higher risk of having learning problems, and this reflects the fact that many of the skills that we do in academic setting are language-based. So reading and writing and math 
all have language components to them. So kids who have broader umbrellas of language processing issues can are at greater risk of having learning problems. And language disorders can manifest at different levels of complexity from mild to more severe. And that's true of many of the neurodevelopmental disorders that I'm gonna to touch on today. So learning disorders are a much more circumscribed kind of neurodevelopmental disorder because they really are terms that only refer to academic difficulties. So underachievement in the presence of adequate cognitive abilities and instruction. These are also very common in the general population with about five to 10% um, who meet diagnostic criteria for a reading disorder. Um, about the same, perhaps slightly less for those who meet diagnostic criteria for a math disorder. And there are important gender differences. Boys are much more likely to be referred for evaluation, which may partly account for why there's a higher ratio of boys to girls, but there may also be just greater genetic susceptibility um, for boys than there is for girls. Um, and finally, these are things that while they may be determined by the cultural constructs around what's expected academically, the disorders themselves are present across cultures and socioeconomic groups. So you can have dyslexia, even in languages that are not English. Um, you can also have, you know, dyslexia or math disabilities, regardless of sort of what the socioeconomic status of the child is. We know that these are highly heritable, so it's not unusual for me to be describing a child's learning disorder and then one of their parents recognizes symptoms in themselves or they recognize symptoms that were in a family member. So about 30 to 80 percent of the variance in our academic skills is explained by heritable factors. And among children who have learning disorders like dyslexia, nearly half can have an affected sibling or parent. It's not uncommon for me to see multiple children within the same family who have um, the same learning disorder, albeit sometimes at different levels of severity. But we also know that it's not a simple kind of inheritance. It's not simple that if your parent has it, then you have it. There are multiple genes that likely impact um, whether or not the presentation is there and also the, to the degree in which it manifests. Comorbidity is the rule, and comorbidity is a medical term that we use to describe when things co-occur, um, when we have more than one condition at a time. So about half of children um, can have difficulties in more than one domain. So for children who have speech and language impairment, about half of them will meet criteria for a reading disorder. Um, 25 to 50% of those with a reading disorder may meet criteria for ADHD. Um, math disorders are often also associated with ADHD as well as anxiety and depression. Um, and there are different kinds of comorbidity. You can have what we call homotypic, which would be sort of two learning disorders at the same time, like a reading and a math disorder. Or you can have heterotypic, which would be something like a reading disorder and ADHD at the same time. Autism spectrum disorders, um, this is an area that has um, had a lot of growth and research and change over the course of even my career um, in terms of how we define it, how we think about it, how it's diagnosed. Um, and But at its core, we recognize that it is characterized by social and communication difficulties, um, and particularly concerns about having a back and forth, being able to kind of step into someone else's shoes and see things from their perspective um, in a way that really allows you to develop or maintain or understand relationships. And in addition to that, you have to have at least some, what we call sort of RRBs or restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest or activities. And this can be things like behavioral inflexibility or a need to follow the same routine, having intense interests in a topic that's above and beyond just a hobby or a, a, you know something that is, is fascinating, but something that is really intense and focused um, and maybe slightly restricted. And then also potentially some sensory processing issues, although we are increasingly acknowledging that these are not unique to autism, but they actually cross diagnoses. Children who have autism may also have um, language impairment and they may also have global cognitive delay. So finally, I'm gonna talk for a minute about intellectual disability. So this is an impairment in general mental abilities that impact domains in three areas. One is conceptual or cognitive, the other is social, and then the final is practical. 
So IQ scores, which have historically been used to define intellectual disability, are now not sort of part of the DSM diagnostic criteria, but they are still part of the conceptualization. So the idea here is that these individuals um, have cognitive abilities and may continue to grow and develop over time, but at a rate that is not um, the same as what we would expect for age-based expectations. And as I was mentioning before, all of these conditions can be associated with medical conditions, including epilepsy or prematurity and genetic disorders, um, and they can also co-occur with each other. I want to talk a little bit about prevalence rates and also specifically about disparities in prevalence um, and identification. Neurodevelopmental disorders impact a huge number of children. Just in the United States alone, approximately one in six have been diagnosed with a developmental disability between 2009 and 2017. Um, there have been increases in the prevalence rates of neurodevelopmental disorders as well, including a, an ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and ID. Um, and this is an, a, a graph shown from the American Academy of Pediatrics that looks at the rates of developmental disability from 1997 all the way to 2017. And you can see this very steady increase in the, in the percentage of children who are diagnosed over time. This likely reflects a combination of factors. One is changes in diagnostic criteria, as well as awareness, um, with the latter being something that I welcome. But the other is probably also um, changes in kind of uh, the diagnostic criteria over time, particularly around autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. If we break this down a little bit and look by disorder, what we see are steady increases in the number of children who are being diagnosed with ADHD. This is major studies. Each of these lines is a major prevalence rate study. And for all of them, you can see this upward trend over time. But we also know that there are significant disparities in ADHD diagnosis. So these are not necessarily independent of culture. And this is a really critical factor to consider when we think about mental health awareness and the youth mental health crisis right now, in that not all children are impacted equally, but also not all children are diagnosed and treated equally. Um, and that is something that we really work um, hard in our um, clinic to sort of make sure that all kids have access to care. But if you look by age, among all children diagnosed with ADHD, what you see is that it's much more likely to, you're much more likely to be diagnosed if you are older, that's what the green bars are, than younger, which is the blue bars. And you're also much more likely to be diagnosed if you are non-Hispanic white or black or African-American um, in the United States. And if we look by economic resource, we see something similar, which is that those individuals who um, are coming from the households with fewer economic resources, you're much more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD um, than households that have more economic resources. So again, there's significant racial and economic disparities in ADHD diagnosis. If we look at Autism spectrum disorder, similarly, there's been an increase over time over the last 20 years. There's been sort of a steady uptick. And again, this partly probably reflects changes in diagnostic criteria that happened right around 2005 with the DSM-5 that came out. Um, but there is also racial and ethnic disparities in terms of diagnosis. Whites are less likely to be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, which suggests that some of the externalizing behaviors that may be in other um, groups may be incorrectly classified as autism spectrum disorder, but that's up for debate and for further research. Regardless of when and where, um, in terms of the diagnosis, early intervention matters. And the reason for this is the brain is growing and time is ticking, is what I like to say. So we in our clinic like to see children early. We like to see them when there are initially concerns because the clock is really ticking in terms of um, when intervention is effective. So over the course of childhood and adolescence, this is a picture of the brain that's actually kind of old at this point, but it's still one of my favorites in that it shows just how much the brain is changing and growing over the course of early childhood and into adolescence. So the hot areas, the red, the yellow, the orange, are areas where a lot of change is happening, whereas the blue areas are where less change is happening over time. And what you can see is just even at the cortical level, there's a tremendous amount of change that's happening in the elementary age years. And while it settles down a little bit as you enter late adolescence and early adulthood, it's still going at that time. 
some of our more recent um, research, and this is work from Leah Somerville at Harvard, has shown that different regions of the brain are changing at different pace at different times in development. And if you look at different aspects of the brain development, um, you see slightly different pictures. So this picture that I was showing you here is the cortex or the cells themselves that are kind of making up the brain. But there are also the highways that connect these cortical regions, which are known as white matter pathways. And they are measured by these yellow bars in terms of their development. And what you see is that the white matter pathways or the highways that connect the brain regions, we now think for the frontal lobes are developing way out into our 30s. And the frontal lobes are those, those regions of the brain that are really important around attentional regulation and executive functions that I was talking about earlier. So what this is really showing us is that the brain is sort of growing at different rates from back to front and also from inside to out so that we are able to kind of take in input from our environments over the course of childhood and adolescence to become sort of optimally developed to meet the demands of adulthood. So when you have a child who has developmental delays, you know, some of the initial thinking was, well, it's, it can be okay because you still have time um, with young children because the brain is plastic and still moving. And this is a hypothesis that was called the developmental lag. So if you say these are two children with these two lines, one who has a typical path and has sort of earlier onset of a skill that eventually they master, and the other who has slightly later onset, um, but eventually kind of catches up um, and, equal, and winds up reaching the same sort of functional ability. But it may not be that simple. Um, because we also now know that there are some children, if there's, if this is the typically developmental curve, and there's a gap that is present early in development, over time, it may actually become wider, because you're adding on to a suboptimal system, a system that's not ready to learn the skills that come after it. And so over time, the difference between the two children magnifies and intensifies over time. We now recognize that this is, is a more common scenario for children who have neurodevelopmental disorders, which means it's really important for us to catch them here, for, to catch them early, to sort of keep these curves as close together as we can. So what, how do we know this and how do we do this? So for children who have reading disorders, we know that phonics-based reading instruction is most effective when it's implemented before the third grade and that poor reading skills in the fourth grade are already predictive of lower levels of employment and economic security, particularly for children who are already impacted by racial and, econ and economic disparities. We know that in terms of mental health benefits, that learning difficulties in childhood are associated with greater risk of psychiatric disorders, including anxiety and mood and OCD and related conditions, as well as serious mental illness and potentially substance abuse in adolescents. And so the reason for this is unclear. Part of this probably has to do with the fact that living with a learning disability increases risk of secondary psychiatric conditions because it's stressful. It can be stressful to go to school every day and feel like you're not able to keep up with your peers, even if you know on some level you're just as smart as they are and have just as many skills. And psychiatric disorders can impact cognitive skills once they start that are important in learning. So if you start with a learning issue and then become anxious about school, the anxiety can then exacerbate the learning issues and, and make academic underachievement worse. And then finally, we also are recognizing that some learning disorders and psychiatric disorders probably share common contributing factors. And so, in other words, they're not necessarily causally related to each other as much as they are more correlational. But once both of the things are active at the same time, it can make our jobs a little bit trickier in terms of promoting healthy development. And so it's really important when you are working with children with neurodevelopmental disorders to start to pay attention to the comorbidity of the mental health conditions. Effective ADHD treatment is also best implemented early in childhood. So kids who are younger than six, our gold standard is parent training and behavioral management. And then for kids who are over six is when we integrate that, but sometimes also add medication. And the addition of medication is something that is often fraught for a lot of families, but for children who have learning issues, it often helps a lot because it helps them to be able to better focus on the tasks that are hard. And if they have learning conditions, then we know that those academic skills are hard. 
Um, and so the medication can often improve their focus and help them sustain effort and attention for longer periods. The benefits of ADHD treatment, whether you do therapy and or medication, um, allows you to better able to manage any comorbid medical conditions. So say if there's a health condition, it's easier for kids um, to sort of engage in care around that, including mental health conditions. There can be improved school performance, peer relationships, family life with less stress. Um, and also importantly for our adolescents, there's an association with reduced risky behaviors, including substance use, early sexual activity, car accidents, driving issues, disruptive behaviors in school. All of those tend to be lesser in children who are effectively treated for ADHD. Autism. Um, we know again here that for autism, early intervention improves social skills and engagement. It can improve language abilities and cognitive skills and reduces maladaptive behaviors and improves functional independence. But importantly, often gives parents confidence um, and as well as sort of improving their mental health so that they can better care for their children. So where and how do we do this? Where are our points of intervention? Um, as we think about how we help um, families and children who are affected by neurodevelopmental conditions. This is a, an image that I borrowed from a psychologist who's named Bronfenbrenner, who sort of first described what we call an ecological theory of, of mental health intervention. And it really is a child-centered approach that puts the child at the center um, of the care and recognizes that the child may have concerns due to, to a combination of psychiatric, genetic, even sort of neuropsychological vulnerabilities. And that around that child, um, we are gonna sort of also, while we're gonna intervene at the level of the child, around that child, we're also gonna intervene at different levels of um, inter intervention, starting with their family, moving out to their peers, and then going out even further to their school and their community. And so as we talk today, I'm gonna to be thinking about how we do this. This is the whole child approach. How do we bring everybody together to sort of best promote the child's development and well-being? So we can think about this and another representation is looking at all of these different sort of spokes on the wheel, thinking about school and medica medical care in terms of family, in terms of their community and their peers. And all of these interventions need to be developmentally appropriate. So what we do in toddler and preschool years is gonna be different than what we do with teens, but we're still gonna have the same framework and same sort of thought process about how do we intervene at all of these different levels. The child's pediatrician is often the person who's sort of coordinating, or I like to say quarterbacking, because it can be overwhelming for families. When you start to talk about having multiple specialists and multiple points of intervention, so, you know, it often comes back to the pediatrician who's helping the family to kind of access resources and guiding them along the path. Um, and so that's, an, I think, also important to recognize in, in the current state of things where there really is a youth mental health crisis. Um, there's a shortage of providers who are providing psych psychiatric and psychological care, but it's also putting pressure on our pediatricians who are trying to kind of navigate and manage this um, in the environment of having fewer resources. So starting with the child, where can we intervene? What resources do we have? Um, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I'm a big believer in neuropsychological evaluations which many of you have probably heard about before. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, but I don't do therapy as much as I do these long evaluations where we really consider um, a child's emotional, behavioral, social, cognitive, and academic skills and the interaction between those things. Um, we also examine a child's relative strengths and weaknesses, trying to find points of you know, power or where they are good at things to leverage that and to also kind of buffer their mental health as they move forward in development. And then thinking about comorbidity, what things are coming together, which one is influencing in the other. Um, and that's important because it'll drive intervention. If we think that anxiety is, is the source of a learning issue, then we'll treat that. But if it's coming from a learning issue that's driving the anxiety, then it's probably better to treat the learning issue. And sometimes we need to think about both, but that's often my job is to sort of figure out kind of which factors are on the table and how we prioritize and make appropriate clinical diagnoses as well as think about comprehensive uh, treatment strategies. 
And one of the things that I think is most important in my job is helping parents to feel empowered to understand their child and also advocate for their needs. So while people think about us being the people who do the testing, I like to say that I do a lot more than just testing. Um, a neuropsychological evaluation will focus on sort of a comprehensive review of your child's records and interviewing the parent and the child and doing questionnaires and thinking about also giving important feedback as we kind of go forward. Other evaluation options, because the neuropsychology and services are also few and far between, they're not enough of us either. Um, so often starting with just your pediatrician or a developmental pediatrician, they're often excellent at doing sort of first line diagnosis and triage. Um, and in particular for ADHD alone, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that that be screened and potentially diagnosed by pediatricians um, and that neuropsychological evaluations be sort of reserved when there are conditions around comorbidity. Child psychologists and psychiatrists can make diagnoses of ADHD and behavioral health conditions also without a neuropsychological evaluation. And then I'm going to talk now about sort of public schools, um, because they are a wealth of resources for children and their families, even though they don't make clinical diagnoses. And that's an important um, distinction. So while they can provide services, they may not necessarily provide um, diagnosis or sort of medical care. And so often kids will need sort of a combination of both school-based services as well as medically-based services. So working with schools. There's a whole alphabet soup around the special education system, and this is often very overwhelming for parents who are trying to navigate this for the first time. But it's important to recognize that the special education system is really there to promote inclusivity and was there because for, and for prior to 1970, one in five U.S. children with disabilities um, were educated. Most of them were excluded from public school education. And so there was a series of civil rights laws in the 70s and 60s um, that, that put in place a system where all children, regardless of their ability, should have access to a public education. Um, and this is still in place today and drives some of the alphabet soup that I'm going to talk about. So early intervention services are part of the special education system. They are federally mandated, but but regulated by states um, in terms of the um, diagnostic classifications and what's eligible. These are services that are available from birth to age two. And then between ages of three and five, children can be found eligible for special education services under an IEP, but it's called Early Childhood Special Education Services. And then when they get to school at between ages six and 22, um, there are two different kinds of special education plans. One is an IEP or an individualized education program, and the other is called a Section 504 plan. Section 504 plans specify accommodations that might be made to a child's environment. So for a child with dyslexia, maybe not being called upon to read aloud at the board um, or having extra time to respond to a question. Services are things that are being delivered to a child um, by a special, um, a specially trained individual. So the same child with dyslexia may have accommodations, as we just described, but also have reading tutoring or instruction with a special education teacher, and that's a service. So IEPs can specify both services and accommodations. Some of the key guiding principles with a special education system are free and appropriate public education, so every child has a right to FAPE, um, and every child should be placed in the least restrictive environment. Um, and it also recognizes that these disabilities can be permanent or temporary. So sometimes we see children who have medical conditions where they need IEP level services for a recovery period from an illness or an injury, um, but they may not need them necessarily permanently. Um, and for other children who have neurodevelopmental disorders, they may need them throughout their educational career. Eligibility for special education services is determined by the schools. Um, so this is an important point, I think, especially for families that are kind of navigating the maze of, of services, um, that while you may have an outside evaluation, including by someone like me, um, the schools will consider those uh, recommendations and clinical diagnoses but it's insufficient for eligibility. They will often have to go through their own process to determine eligibility. And usually that entails the school doing some testing themselves. 
Um, and they may do academic testing, they may do a psychological evaluation, and they may also do occupational physical therapy or speech and language evaluations. But they usually do not provide clinical diagnoses or comprehensive treatment plans. They are designed to determine whether services are needed for a child to access the curriculum. A child can be found eligible for special education services under one of 13 federally defined diagnostic classifications, but it's important to note that while those overlap with clinical diagnoses, just because the school has found a child eligible for a diagnostic classification doesn't mean that an actual clinical diagnosis has been made. So this can get really confusing very quickly, um, but eligibility is something that um, can be done basically for, at any point from birth to 22. The kinds of school services that can be included are listed here, many of which are important when we think about mental health for children with neurodevelopmental disorders, including school-based counseling and social skills training, as well as ABA therapy for those with autism. And some children may also be placed in a special classroom placement, like a therapeutic setting, um, in order to access the curriculum. There are millions of children in the United States who are receiving special education services. So in the United States in the fall of 2020, which was right after the pandemic started, nearly 7 million children between the ages of 6 and 17 were receiving special education services. That also corresponds with the high numbers of children who are diagnosed with neurodevelopmental disorders that I was talking about earlier. And among these, um, all of those children who are receiving services the largest classification criteria are children with learning disorders, um, it representing two and a quarter million ch children in the United States. And so when we think about how many children are being impacted, we have to think a lot about caregiver resilience. So sort of moving out now from schools to thinking about the parents, because parents are under a tremendous amount of stress when they're trying to navigate both the me medical and mental health system as well as the school system. And many of us will think about, you know, diagnosing a child as really the point of divergence along two paths. But in fact, for many parents, it actually feels a lot more like this. It feels a lot more like they've been put at the beginning of a maze and they have to find their way to the center, but they can't see ab above the hedge. And they may make some wrong turns and be frustrated at times as they try to get through it. And so we need to help our parents with um, helping their children. In terms of neurodevelopmental disorders and caregiver stress, um, the graph on the right shows the different diagnoses. Um, so autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, ADHD, um, and then moving towards learning disorders and, and developmental coordination disorder. And what you can see just by looking at the bars is that the stress is highest in parents who are of children who have autism spectrum disorder or global developmental delay. But there's still considerable stress for parents who have 80, children with ADHD and learning disorders. And the graph on the right shows that this is so much more likely to happen with younger children. So the, the, you see a line here where um, the, the degree of stress decreases over time. But for younger children who are sort of closer to diagnosis, caregiving can be particularly stressful. This likely reflects sort of the state, what we think of as the stages of change. So when a parent is first sort of coming to terms with a child's diagnosis or their condition or sort of understanding who they are, um, there's often parents will describe to me this sort of nagging sense that something is going on, but they may be able to sort of push that away. And they're really in what we would consider to be a stage of pre-contemplation. About the time that they call my office to make an appointment, they're in contemplation. They start to kind of say, okay, well, I can't quite ignore this. I actually really do need to think about what's going on with my child. And as they're waiting for the appointment, they're often in sort of preparation mode. They're thinking about, okay, what might this be? What would I potentially need to be asked to do? And how would I kind of think about doing this for myself and for my family and for my child? Around the time we get to diagnosis is around when we get to sort of action and shifting into action, moving now from sort of, now we know what it is, now what do we do about it? And that phase can be very overwhelming because of all of the system elements that I was just showing you. Um, and it can take a while for parents to get to a place of maintenance or equilibrium where they're comfortable with their child in terms of their strengths and their vulnerabilities and also the system in which, and have a system to support them. This process can take years 
For some, it takes months, but for many, it takes years. And it's not uncommon for two parents to be in different places. It's not important and common for grandparents to be in different places than parents. Um, and in, people may be moving back and forth between these stages over time. So the progress may not necessarily be linear either. So we have to kind of give a lot of grace for our parents as they're kind of trying to come to terms with who their child is and how to best support them, because this process is hard. So some of the hard things for parents, most parents have an idealized image in their child of who their child will be when they're born. They sort of have dreams and visions about who their child may become. And the diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder for many parents sort of sparks a grieving process around their loss of an idealized image. Um, and, I, and ideally, we help parents sort of shift away from that, recognizing that part of parenting for any child is that you're, they're not necessarily going to turn out who you, to be who you thought they were going to be. Um, but for parents of children who have neurodevelopmental disorders, they often encounter this earlier and in ways that are, that are harder um, and need more time to sort of process. It's also challenging for parents to rebalance priorities and responsibilities, especially if there are multiple children. And maintaining connections with family and friends can be hard. They can feel isolated or different because of the journey that they're on, but also their time is more limited because they may be trying to navigate this whole labyrinth of, of specialists and specialties. Um, there's also dealing with the ignorance and stigma that's in society and feeling like that's another challenge that sometimes some days is too much to do when there's when they already have their plates are full with the balancing their family responsibilities. And then maintaining stamina for caregiving over time. It's a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, and it can be hard to kind of hold the energy um, for that length of time. And then finally, as we've been discussing, finding and accessing resources for, for their child can be really hard, um, especially in this day and age and navigating the differences between siblings. So how do we do this? How do we support caregivers as we go along? You know, a lot of caregivers will tell me that they, you know, get annoyed when people tell them that they need to take time for self-care because people start to think about going to the spa or, you know, taking an afternoon off. And for many caregivers of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, that's not an option. And so what we focus on are more about the small things and the small moments. So when you drop your child at the bus in the morning, can you take two minutes in the car just to close your eyes and center yourself and breathe? to do a mini meditation in the morning before you get up out of bed, um, to remember to take a minute to drink your coffee at the kitchen counter um, before you start multitasking and it grows cold. So to actually do self-care through a series of small things that can be integrated easily through the courses of the day, as opposed to sort of setting aside time for big things once in the blue moon. It's important to take care of the family and being open to support from friends and family as well as seeking out high quality information. I talk to parents all the time about how they're gonna be tempted to go out to Dr. Google and Dr. Google is wonderful um, and provides a huge vast set of resources, but it's not all applicable to your family and it's not all accurate. And so it's really important to seek out high quality information and not get overwhelmed by a lot of the noise um, of things that are not accurate or important. Related to this, Participating in patient advocacy groups can be a source of enormous strength for many families, as well as a resource for good information. Um, and there are many good ones um, for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And then also recognizing because these things come in families, that even if you had similar struggles, your child's path may be different. There's a huge amount of more awareness of neurodevelopmental disorders and how to treat them and how to intervene and be successful. Um, and also there may be different levels of severity over time. And then finally, recognizing when you may need help um, and not being afraid to necessarily ask for it. So for parenting children, um, I think it's really important, I say, to remember that your child is not a diagnosis. So just because your child has dyslexia does not mean that they are not capable of doing wonderful things. And in fact, many children with dyslexia um, have create, creative and hands-on skills that exceed those of their peers. And so while it's important to address the areas of concern, it's also important to not let them necessarily overtake your child's entire identity um, and the entire focus around your parent-child relationship. 
So remembering to celebrate their strengths and finding areas where they can succeed, making time for fun together, not just therapies, but also making time to just do things that are silly and fun and enjoyable. Um, and aiming for progress rather than perfection. This really helps with the marathon. So if we aim for perfection, it's really hard to sort of sustain that, but allowing that your child is just making progress and some days you just wanna kind of keep moving forward, that can be good enough. Differentiating between can't do and hard to do. This is a really tricky one because when you have a child who's been identified as having a disability, often other people will think that they can't do certain things. Um, and if you sort of adopt that mentality, then that can be sort of self-perpetuating for your child. And, and while there may be truly things that they cannot do, there may be many things that they can do, but that are hard to do. And so normalizing that struggle while also not minimizing their difficulties is a really fine line to walk. And that's one where parents often need some help from outside providers. Helping them to develop their skills to handle the big feelings because they may have some because they're going to encounter some frustration. And so helping them to sort of think through this is also beneficial for their mental health and well-being over the course of their lifespan. And then finally, really helping them to find their tribe. And what I mean by this, they're helping them to find other kids who are like them, who can all have similar struggles, but who also appreciate them for who they are and how wonderful they are. And this is all really important and then eventually helping your child understand themselves, which is a critical part about buffering them from negative mental health outcomes. And these are conversations that you may have more than once. And so when you're having them, it's really important to use developmentally appropriate language. So if you have a child who has ADHD and they're six, you might talk about having the wiggles or the sillies. But when you have a child who is 15, you might talk about difficulties concentrating and how they help them, how they can hyper-focus in some situations, but in others, they can get easily distracted and then thinking about strategies that might help them with that knowledge. It can be really useful to use stories of, in the media of children who've had similar struggles um, and to make space for their questions and follow their lead. And they will ask questions if you make space for that. These are often the car questions where you're having a conversation in the car and from the back seat, they're asking you things about themselves. And it may be better to have smaller and more frequent conversations rather than just one big one. It's not a sort of sit down and tell you now, here's the diagnosis, as much as it is that you're working up to that language over the course of their childhood and adolescence. And recognizing that any of these challenges may be only one aspect of their identity development. It shouldn't be the only aspect of their identity. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through a little bit around community advocacy and government policy here because I want to make sure that I have a few minutes to talk a little bit about the post-COVID landscape because I think that's especially important when we're thinking about mental health for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. But what I wanna sort of highlight here is that education is a social determinant of health. It's associated with all kinds of health outcomes over the long run. And we know that children who have learning disorders, especially if they are impacted by racial or economic disparities are at much higher risk of not just academic underachievement, but going onto what we call the school to prison pipeline, they're much greater risk of being incarcerated. We also know that early intervention and screening is important. Um, and so as we think about advocacy, which often comes with parents who are in the maintenance phase, advocating for things like state mandated dyslexia screening, which we fortunately have in Massachusetts. So every child is screened by kindergarten for dyslexia um, to make sure that we're catching things. Similarly, with autism, there are AAP guidelines say that there should be screening at 18 and 24 months. But what we know is that that doesn't always happen, that a significant proportion of children are not screened and not diagnosed until they're much later. And then we've missed critical points of intervention. So in the post-pandemic landscape, this is especially critical and key. Um, we know that the educational disruption that happened during the COVID pandemic, while it may have been necessary to sort of fight public health, um, a spread of the illness itself, disproportionately impacted those with neurodevelopmental disorders. It led to late identification of the dis disorders, late access to special education services and accommodations, and a lack of in-home and psychosocial services. This was particularly true for children who were in rural areas, who had fewer economic resources, for those who were already impacted by racial and ethnic minorities um, or disparities, and those who were in longer periods of remote or hybrid instruction, including the state of Massachusetts. 
Um, I need to give a hat tip to some collaborators and I who have been with me who've been working on this for a while, Dr. Glenn and Dr. Reisman. Um, we have a forthcoming book coming out about just um, the post-COVID landscape in terms of development. But this is an image that shows you how school, how big um, an impact this had in terms of school closures across the globe. The dark blue is where you see that schools were completely closed, and this was as of April 20th, 2020. School, um, part, the lighter blue is where schools were partially open. But in April of 2020, there were 1.4 billion students who were out of school um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the United States, um, the closures lasted for over a year. Um, and so this was a huge length of time and it varied from state to state. Um, but what we saw is that for um, certain states, um, there were long closures, especially um, when we start to look at disparities in terms of economics as well. Um, so high poverty schools were more likely to be closed longer. So again, we are exacerbating pre-existing disparities. We know that fewer children entered preschool we know that fewer children entered kindergarten on time. And so both of these things mean that many schools, um, many children are coming into school for the first time, not having pre-existing um, ac early academic skills. Absenteeism increased, especially in high schoolers. We lost a significant number of students in the system where kids just didn't come back after the COVID-19 pandemic, especially again, children who were impacted by racial and economic disparities. For those who were um, had neurodevelopmental disorders who had access to special education services, many of them did not receive their special education services. And for those who did, um, many of those services were provided virtually with any without any guidance around efficacy um, because there really was none. And so teachers were often left to sort of do the best they could, um, but that was it was hard for many families with children who had neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, approximately 40% were not receiving special education services in the spring of 2020, um, and some, most of them were not receiving all of their services. Um, and so what this led to is the number of children even eligible for special education services declined for the first time in the prior 10 years. In 2020, only 7.2 million children were eligible for IEP level services, um, when this had steadily been climbing for the prior 10 years. We also know that test scores declined, and I'm not going to get into this as much other than to say that it was for math and for reading, and it was exacerbated again for children who were already impacted by racial and ethnic um, and economic disparities. And so when we think about kind of future directions in this post-pandemic world, um, we know now that um, the educational disruption was unprecedented in terms of its extent and duration, and that children may be on different developmental trajectories with children who were impacted by neurodevelopmental disorders being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, which has generated a mental health crisis. Um, so the children who we see who have neurodevelopmental disorders are at much greater risk of having mental health concerns now, and there's a lack of resources around that. So there's a need for ongoing services and long-term implications for society here and for all of us to kind of do what we can to advocate on behalf of these vulnerable children and to provide more access to resources, including education about the prevalence of mental health conditions and neurodevelopmental disorders. So I want to thank you all for listening today. This is our team at LEAP. Um, these are all of our psychologists and fellows and administrative fellow people who help us um, to see all of the children who we can see. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Colvin. We're now at the end of this session. If you have any questions for Dr. Colvin, feel free to enter them in the chat. We have a question regarding what do you recommend for parents who cannot afford self-pay ADHD assessments since insurance does not pay for ADHD mm -hmm. assessments? And is it enough to diagnose ADHD based on parent and teacher self-reports? I could give a whole hour lecture on the problem with this. Um, it really creates a catch-22 for many families in that ADHD is often excluded from insurance coverage. Um, and I have a whole soapbox about how that's not, that shouldn't be that way. Um, and in fact, uh, it's work that I'm doing actually at the national level right now to sort of advocate, um, to try to get insurance companies to identify that ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition and it's frequently comorbid and we need to actually do more than just screening questionnaires. 
Um, but unfortunately, that is the current guidance from the AAP. And so I think, you know, what we have done in our clinic is really we're trying to sort of develop um, kind of narrower evaluations um, that sort of bridge the middle ground between a full neuropsych evaluation and, and the screening questions um, to try to address this. But it is a real problem, and, and especially for families who don't have the means of, um, of, of, of private evaluations. Thank you. And how are pediatricians trained to recognize early conditions? Sometimes parents' concerns are not acknowledged and the pediatricians do not always have time to spend with the child during an appointment. The screening tools, such as questionnaires that parents complete, sometimes can be misinterpreted, especially by first-time parents. In this person's experience, there's a lot of desire in this area and um, includes a comment about maybe parents should be asked to record short videos of their child doing X, Y, Z and have the pediatrician review those at appointments. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I actually really love videos. I like it when parents bring me videos of their children um, because the child who I see in the office, it may take, I see them for long periods of time. So usually over the course of several hours, I'll see the child who they describe at home but maybe not in the first hour. And so if I have a video sort of um, showing me sort of what's going on at home, that's really useful. Um, I do think that first time parents are at a disadvantage here um, in terms of sort of understanding where their milestone, where their children are meeting the milestones. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why we often see sort of delayed um, diagnosis, especially for children um, who are young right now. We're seeing a lot of children who didn't go to preschool, who didn't go to daycare, who, and who didn't go into kindergarten until later. And so we have a lot of like late diagnoses of things right now. Um, so I do think also, and, and if your child is in preschool or in daycare, sort of asking those, those individuals who often have a wealth of experience just sort of being with kids about that. Um, but I think with pediatricians, having the videos is important. I think many pediatricians are extremely well trained, um, but I think there's some variability and, you know, sometimes developmental pediatricians sort of are the next line up um, where a pediatrician may refer to a developmental pediatrician who then may actually refer to us next. But if you ever have concern, I think it's worth talking to your pediatrician about it. Thank you. What strategies do you use to build trust and rapport with your young clients? Um, you know, I think that's one of the major things that we spend a lot of time doing um, and talking about even in our clinic is, you know, when kids come to see us, um, they often sort of register us as being a little bit more like school um, than we try. And we try to keep it that way. We just sort of don't wear white coats or we will tell our young children, too, that we are not the kind of doctor that's going to give them shots or look in their ears or weigh them. Um, and we will explain to them what's going to happen um, because, you know, part of what we do is to, is part of an ascent and a consent, which we believe should happen at any at any point, um, even for children. Um, and so describing to them, you might do some drawings or you might play some things that look like games or do some puzzles and then assuring them that they're just supposed to try their best. They're not supposed to get everything right um, and that we want them to kind of show us what they know. Um, we will do behavioral strategies where we'll do stickers and take breaks and most of them eat with us and have lots of snacks and get up and move around. Um, and all of that is so that we can really see them at their best and see what they're capable of doing. Thank you. What resources or activities do you recommend for parents to support their child's mental health well-being outside of interventions? That's great. Um, you know, I think the the things that I would really think about right now is also recognizing that they th it's been a stressful few years. I mean, it's been stressful for all of us, um, but I think it's been stressful for kids. And the time of which that those pandemic years happened for most children has been a, a significant proportion of their life. And at every single developmental stage, they were impacted. So I've talked a lot about younger children, or, but I also think about, you know, our tweens and our teens who sort of miss some pretty important milestones or even developmental windows. And so in this stage of, of where we are in history, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of our kids are under more stress um, than they were even 10 years ago. And to, you know, slow things down to some extent, um, to give them time to just be um, and to be as a family and to remember, you know, to spend time together as a family and to make make fun 
but also to open up space for them to talk about their days. Um, and that may not necessarily be something that, you know, um, they will volunteer. But if you can think about a hook question, if you can think about like, you know, what happened during lunch or what happened during recess, as opposed to sort of how was your day? That's often a really hard question for a child to answer. But if you can sort of think about, you know, how is how is gymnastics or any of these kinds of little things, it can be much easier to kind of pull out and express interest in them. And over the course of you continuing expressing interest, they'll be much more likely to share. And then it gives you opportunities and windows to sort of bridge a, an alliance with them. Thank you. That's helpful. It looks like we're out of time. And before we end today's session, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience, Dr. Colvin? Thank you all for being here. And thank you all for caring about this topic and for caring about the kids who are in your lives. Um, and I hope this is helpful and I'm happy to be a resource if needed. Thank you, Dr. Colvin. For everyone who took the time to join us today, thank you so much. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. It'll be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Sorry about that. <laughs> think for a second. <laughs> Have a lovely rest of the day.